protests in Iran. A closer look at the volatile situation following the death of a young woman in police custody. Korean tensions. Updating the latest escalation of missile tests and military drills. Controversial ad. How a political candidate in one U.S. state is using the birth of her child to advocate for abortion. And becoming a saint. What Pope Francis says about how holiness is achieved in daily life. On EWTN News Nightly for Thursday, October 6th, 2022. Thank you so much for being with us tonight on this Feast of St. Bruno. I'm Tracy Sable. We begin tonight with a tragic story in Thailand where an attack at a daycare center killed more than 30 people, mostly children. <laughs> More than 20 other people were injured in the rampage. The attacker later killed his wife and child before taking his own life. He is identified as a former policeman who was fired earlier this year because of a drug charge. In Ukraine, emergency crews respond to a Russian attack against the city near Europe's biggest nuclear power plant. Multiple rockets hit a residential area, killing at least one person, injuring several others. Earlier in Ukraine, announced that it had taken three villages back from Russian control. On North Korea, test firing two more ballistic missiles overnight, two days after launching an intermediate range ballistic missile over Japan. Japan. North Korea has conducted 24 missile tests so far this year. The U.S. reacted quickly, moving a Navy aircraft carrier strike group into the waters off the Korean peninsula. South Korea is calling the North's recent launches a serious provocation that threatens peace and security. As North Korea continues to break its own missile launch record, South Korea says trilateral naval exercises are back in its waters. The U.S., South Korea and Japan holding drills to track and intercept missiles, our response to the North's launches. What is the impact of all this, you know, American aircraft carriers cruising around Korea? Pretty much nothing. It will probably make some people in the United States and Republic of Korea a bit happier, but it will have zero impact on North Korea's behavior and decision making. North Korea blamed their recent flurry on the U.S. Thursday, calling them just counteraction measures against last week's U.S. South Korean naval drills. It will only increase the condemnation, increase the isolation, increase the steps that are taken uh, in response to their actions. But the United Nations Security Council hearing this week suggested Pyongyang is not isolated. While the U.S. blamed Russia and China without naming them for enabling North Korea, Russia and China blamed the United States for increasing tensions, a schism that benefits Pyongyang. Kim Jong-un is doing what he thinks he can get away with. Uh, he's not expecting any kind of strong U.S. reaction. He's letting the South Korean government and the U.S. government know that he has significant capability. North Korea is expected to continue capitalizing on geopolitical turmoil. A seventh underground nuclear test expected at any time. If it happens, it will most likely happen after the Chinese Party Congress so as not to anger its main benefactor. Kim Jong-un also released a five-year plan less than two years ago. He appears to be working his way through that list. A U.S. intelligence officials say the North's missile tests do not pose an immediate threat to the United States. Well, Japan calls for the immediate release of a journalist who has received a prison sentence in Myanmar, also known as Burma. A cabinet official pledges continued support for Toru Kabuda, who received a seven-year term for filming an anti-government protest last July. The journalist faces additional charges for violations of Myanmar's immigration laws. A rescue crew searched for shipwrecked survivors in the cliffs 
off a southern Greek island where a boat carrying scores of migrants crashed ashore in high winds and waves. A separate search is underway near Lesbos where a second boat sank. The combined death toll is now more than 20 people. A protest in Iran following the death of a 22-year-old woman detained by the country's morality police have stretched into a third week and there is no sign that the demonstrations will slow down. I recently sat down with independent journalist Mary Mohammadi, a native of Iran now living in the United States who is keeping a close eye on the volatile situation in her home country. Mary, I want to thank you so much for agreeing to talk to us today. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Um, we've been seeing what's been playing out um, after the death of 22-year-old Masa Amini uh, and all the protests that have popped up all around Iran. Um, can you talk to us a little bit more about that? I know that you're in touch with people uh, in your home country. What are they saying about what's happening over there? Um, well, you know, um, Mahsa Amini was murdered by morality patrol in Iran because of hijab. And um, uh, she just um, hadn't covered her hair completely by her scarf. And um, after that, after I think two days, um, it was like um, a spark and like a, a fire under the ashes that er erupted suddenly. For more than two weeks, uh, People of Iran are protesting days and nights in uh, Iran, and th this is very dangerous. This is uh, different from America, and uh, security guards uh, are killing protesters by uh, billy clubs and by bullets. But many of protesters who were killed are uh, considered child because they are under the age of 18. They they really. Uh, uh, fight for freedom. Compulsory hijab, I can say this is one of the smallest problem of uh, Iranians. And uh, not only compulsory hijab, not only oppression of women, every single person is under pressure because everywhere that there is not freedom, all people are under pressure. For example, um, religious minorities, ethnic minorities, women, even men. And I know this is your first interview in English, um, especially talking about these protests. Why was it important for you to talk about this? Because, um, you know, it, it's not the first protest of Iranians, but this is the first time that the world could hear our, uh, our voice. And um, the, the people, you know, they, they, are, they are in Iran and their internet is really limited. And this is my duty to be their voice. Telegram and signal applications uh, were filtered. Uh, and, but in this protest, even WhatsApp and Instagram uh, were filtered too. This is very hard to send texts for others, even my family. They, they, it's very hard for them to uh, send me a message, in, for example, on WhatsApp. I, I was um, unaware of my mother for days in this protest, in the ongoing protest. And, um, and also up, down, to download or upload videos or pictures are really hard. And they can't share their, uh, the, the picture of their uh, protest in the streets to media. Their access is really limited. What would you like to see the international community, the United States, do? What, what would you like them to do, or at least say? For protesters? I, um, I think they can do two things. Um, one of them is uh, supporting protesters. And uh, on the other hand, they uh, should put pressure on uh, diplomatics in America, in Europe. It's a scary situation, yet they're still protesting. It's more than a protest. I, I, um, I think it's, um, we, it's better to call these people revolutionary, not protester. Because the only demand of these people is a complete revolution. Do you think it will happen? I really hope so that we can make it. Um, but I don't know we can do it in this protest or not. Nobody can say that. Um, but we know if not tomorrow, 
maybe next week. It's, it's close to us. This is uh, different from classical revolution that we had in um, 20th century. And uh, this is leaderless, and they just are fighting for freedom. And tomorrow, in part two of our interview with Mary Mohammadi, she talks to us about why she converted to Christianity and the struggles she faced because of it. Uh, the religious community founded by St. Jose Maria Escriva is beginning its formal process of reform. The prelate of Opus Dei wrote, quote, let us entrust all of this effort to the intercession of St. Jose Maria as we celebrate the 20th anniversary of his canonization tomorrow. Monsignor Fernando O'Carras says the group will meet in June following recent instructions from Pope Francis. And more details on this story are available online at catholicnewsagency.com. Our President Joe Biden is dealing with some more bad news on the economic front. Major oil producing countries led by Saudi Arabia and Russia are slashing the amount of oil they deliver to the global economy. In short, that could mean shelling out more dough at the gas pump. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. Owen. Hi, Tracy, and good evening to you. Before President Joe Biden flew off to New York today for a tour of IBM, he was asked about the oil production cut by OPEC Plus, 2 million barrels a day starting in November, which incidentally is when the midterm elections arrive. Walking towards Marine One, President Joe Biden stops briefly to take a few questions from reporters. And when asked what his reaction is to the move by OPEC Plus. Disappointment, and uh, we're looking at what alternatives we may have. And whether he regretted his earlier trip to Saudi Arabia. The, the trip was not essentially for oil. The trip was about the Middle East and about Israel and, and rationalization of positions. But it is a disappointment, and it says that there are problems. American drivers right now are paying, according to the latest AAA average, 3.86 a gallon, down from this past summer's record soaring highs, but as of late, back on the rise. And with inflation still eating into paychecks, the Republican National Committee tweets, unleash American energy. And the quantum computing is going to revolutionize it. Absolutely. Yes. Meanwhile, at the IBM facility in Poughkeepsie, New York, the president celebrates a new $20 billion investment by the company, which the White House says will bolster research and development and manufacturing of semiconductors, mainframe technology, artificial intelligence, and quantum computing. And it's here now where the Hudson Valley could become the epicenter of the future of quantum computing, the most advanced and fastest computing ever, ever seen in the world. Separately, after a federal appeals court issued a ruling that leaves the future of Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or DACA, up in the air, last night the president released a statement saying he's disappointed, blamed mega Republican officials, and added, And while we will use the tools we have to allow dreamers to live and work in the only country they know as home, it is long past time for Congress to pass permanent protections for dreamers, including a pathway to citizenship. Also today on a busy news day, we just learned this afternoon President Biden is pardoning thousands of Americans convicted of simple possession of marijuana under federal law. He said in a statement this afternoon, quote, no one should be in jail just for using or possessing marijuana, end quote. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. Coming up, a political candidate in one state commits to opposing a pro-life bill. Plus, another candidate promotes support for abortion in a controversial campaign ad. Well, the Christian cake maker in Colorado who claimed a Supreme Court victory after refusing to make a cake for a same-sex wedding is back in the spotlight. Jack Phillips is challenging a ruling that he violated the state's anti-discrimination law for refusing to make a cake in 2017 for a gender transition. Yesterday, his lawyers called for an appeals court to overturn last year's ruling in favor of a transgender woman. At least 66 clinics have stopped providing abortions in 15 states since the U.S. Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. These numbers are from a Guttmacher Institute analysis released today. The new report does not include data on hospitals or physician offices that provided services. A Maine's former Governor Paul LePage says that he would veto a bill that would ban abortions at 15 weeks. The Republican candidate is made the commitment 
commitment during a debate Tuesday night. Incumbent Democratic Governor Janet Mills fully, fully that is, supports abortion access. A political candidate in Louisiana has released a campaign ad that features the birth of her second child, but she uses the birth to highlight her support for abortion. Louisiana's new abortion ban, one of the strictest and most severe in the country. We should be putting pregnant women at ease, not putting their lives at risk. Democrat Kate Darling says that she decided to run for a spot in the U.S. House after Roe versus Wade was overturned. She calls Louisiana's abortion ban, quote, dangerous for women. Darling is running against Majority Whip Steve Scalise. And we go now to Dr. Gracie Christie, a senior fellow at the Catholic Association and host of EWTN's Conversations with Consequences. She is also a practicing radiologist. Gracie, great to see you again. Um, the candidate says an abortion ban is dangerous for women. I know that you recently addressed this issue in The Federalist. Talk to us more about that and also the data that you found. Well, I made a deep dive into statistics around the claim that abortion, that giving birth is 14 times more dangerous than an abortion. And this is a claim that's been widely disseminated. It's widely believed. It's even in the dissent of the Big Dobbs case in the dissenting uh, Supreme Court justices' brief, their dissenting um, opinion. And um, it's absolutely wrong. I made a deep dive into the statistics. And the fact is, is that it's a case of what we call in statistics, garbage in, garbage out, which means if you're using the wrong data, you're also going to get the wrong results and you're going to make the wrong conclusions. And in this case, pregnancy uh, sometimes uh, and childbirth sometimes are dangerous for women. And that's a terrible thing. But it's not uh, 14 times more dangerous than abortion. Not at all. You know, what kind of message do you think that sends to women? Well, it's a terrifying message because the, the great delight for most women, including me and you, I know, that the great delight of our lives is our children. So to terrify women out of pregnancy and childbirth, to tell them that it's that we're living in, in ancient times where when you got pregnant, you were taking your life into your hands, is simply not true. I'll give you an example. In 2013, the CDC counted 187 women that uh, they said had died uh, from pregnancy-related causes that were over 85 years old. So that's how bad the data has been historically. So it's it's true. Some women, unfortunately, um, meet uh, terrible complications in pregnancy and childbirth, but these are a small minority, and abortion is not any safer, and in fact, it's more dangerous than pregnancy and childbirth. Yeah, and I know in your article, I mean, you mentioned that it has never been more safe for a woman to deliver a child. Um, talk to us more about that. Well, we have tremendous advances in, in childbirth and, and, and in pregnancy care. And we very, we're very fortunate to live in the, in the Western world where medicine is so advanced. And if women get good, pre, uh, pre, if they get good uh, care during their pregnancy and they visit their doctor and uh, they do all the things that they're supposed to do and that our country, thankfully, has available to them, then they should expect to have a healthy baby. And this is usually very often, most often, the outcome that we all find when a woman delivers her baby. I'm curious, when did this argument start floating around, you know, that childbirth is more dangerous than abortion? I think what's happened is that the, 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 great, the great lie of the pro-abortion left for so many decades has been that the child is not a person, but that has been, or that it's not even alive or not human. And that has been laid to rest with all these wonderful advances like ultrasound technology, which is what I work in uh, every day. And so we all know that a baby inside uh, his or her mother is very much alive and very human. So now what they're trying to do is scare us out of wanting to be pregnant and wanting to give birth to our beautiful children. Uh, because what they really want is to support abortion because abortion is liberating in their mentality and they want to support Planned Parenthood, and, and it's just part of their big political ploy. But pregnancy and childbirth are very safe, and it could be safer. Let's make it safer, but let's not turn it into a political game. Yeah, and it is a beautiful thing. Uh, Dr. Christie, thank you so much for coming on. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Up next, we learn more about the Holy Father's upcoming visit to a Middle Eastern country. Plus, what Pope Francis says about how to become a saint.
È importante scoprire la santità nel popolo santo di Dio. Papa Francis says the saints are not disconnected from the realities of life. In remarks to a Vatican conference today, the Pope says holiness requires us to faithfully live the gospel while carrying out daily responsibilities. The Vatican has released the full itinerary for the Pope's upcoming trip to Bahrain. During his four-day visit, the Holy Father will attend the Bahrain Forum for Dialogue. The theme of the apostolic journey is peace on earth to people of goodwill. There are an estimated 80,000 Catholics in Bahrain, many of whom are migrants. EWTN News Rome correspondent Colm Flynn joins us now. Colm, great to see you as always. So what can you tell us about this announcement of the upcoming papal trip? Well, a very good evening, Tracy, from Rome. Yes, the Vatican has just announced Pope Francis's itinerary for his upcoming trip to the Kingdom of Bahrain, which will take place from November the 3rd to November the 6th. And the theme of this visit, Tracy, they've just announced is peace on earth to people of goodwill. So this will be another trip to further advance the Pope's mission of interreligious dialogue with the Muslim community. The Kingdom of Bahrain is a small desert country nestled between Qatar and Saudi Arabia. It has a small population of about just 1.7 million people, 70% of which are Muslim, around 14% of which are Christian. And many of those Christians are from Asia, the Philippines, India. And this is where the first Catholic church was built on the Persian in Gulf, and the Pope is visiting at the invitation of the King of Bahrain, Hamad bin Isa al Khalifa. So, this is the first time a Pope has ever visited the country, so it'll be quite a significant visit. And as well as the meeting Tracy, uh, meeting the King and other government officials, the Pope will visit the capital, Manama, where the Pope will take part in a conference. Now, the name of the conference is the Bahrain Forum for Dialogue East and West for Human Coexistence. He will give the closing address of that conference. And Tracy, interestingly, also traveling to Bahrain for the conference is Ahmed El Tieb, the Grand Imam of al Zazar, And it has been announced that those two major religious leaders will meet. The two of them most recently met in September at an interreligious summit in Kazakhstan. Now, the Pope is also due to visit the country's magnificent new cathedral. It's called the Cathedral of Our Lady of Arabia. It was inaugurated back in 2021, and it was the dream of a bishop named Camillo Balin, who died in 2020 after 50 years, five decades, serving in the Gulf region. The cathedral can hold around 2,500 people, and it was built outside the capital on land that was donated by the king. And it is believed that this will be one of the key stops for Pope Francis to to show his respect for the late bishop and the work he did, what he achieved in that region, and that should be another incredible part of this upcoming trip. Absolutely. And Tom, I understand this journey to Bahrain really aligns with what we know has been one of the main hallmarks of the Holy Father's papacy to reach out to people of other faiths. Yes, that's right, Tracy, and particularly, of course, the Muslim community. How could we forget Pope Francis's historic trip to Iraq last year, where he met with the Grand Ayatollah Al Al Sistani, the first pope in history to visit Iraq, known as the Cradle of Civilization, and then just recently his apostolic trip to the Muslim nation of Kazakhstan, where only one percent of the population are Catholics. And actually, Tracy EWTN traveled to the nation of the United Arab Emirates back in March of this year to interview. Cardinal Pietro Parolin. He is the Secretary of State. Pope Francis had sent him to represent the Holy See at the Dubai Expo, where the motto of that exhibition was deepening the connection. So again, all these show Pope Francis's dedication to interreligious dialogue, as you say. And Colin, before I let you go, are there concerns that the Holy Father may cancel this trip like he did with previous trips because of health issues? Well, you're right, because the concerns for the Holy Father's health over the last number of months and the last year has led many people to wonder, every time the Vatican announces an upcoming trip uh, on the Pope's calendar, it, will it go ahead or not? Remember, he was forced at the last minute to cancel his two trips this summer to the Democratic Republic of Congo and South Sudan. However, his trip to Canada shortly after still did go ahead. So for this trip, we will have to wait and see. But at the moment, Tracy, it has been officially announced by the Vatican. As I said, it will be a short trip three-day visit, November the 3rd to November the 6th. Okay, and thank you so much for that report, Colin. Colin Flynn, EWTN Newsroom correspondent. Thank you again. 
and thank you for watching tonight. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.